Hello, can you all hear me okay? So I'm Lisa Talia Ferry, I'm an engineering technical writer here at DigitalOcean. Uh, to give you a little bit of a background of DigitalOcean, uh, it's cloud computing designed for developers. Uh, DigitalOcean is on a mission to simplify the complexity of web infrastructure. Uh, we want to empower developers and facilitate innovation. Uh, my personal role as the engineering technical writer is on the community team. I write tutorials about software development and my colleagues write tutorials about sysadmin and DevOps um, content. And we have about 1,700 tutorials now. If you Google things like how do I do something with a server, you probably will run into our tutorials. Uh, they're all free for everyone to use and Creative Commons license. And the short link for our tutorials, if you're interested, is do.co slash tutorials. Um, so I'm going to be talking you through creating and setting up a droplet on DigitalOcean. Um, that's what the credit is for. Um, so if you have not done so already, if you navigate to do.co or to digitalocean.com, it's in the top right corner. You could sign up. If you already have an account, uh, you could go ahead and log in. Um, does anybody need some time to do this? Uh, so again, the credit is DOWWC15. So if we have um, our account set up now, um, we could go ahead uh, into, once you're logged in, you'll have a adorable image of you as a sea creature. Um, and then you could go to this create button on the top right corner. It's a green button and it should show up a drop down menu. And we're going to go with droplets to begin with and select that to create a our cloud server. Once you do that, you should land on this page. Does anybody need any more time right now? Uh, so we're going to choose an image. And for this workshop, we're going to be working with Core OS. Uh, we're going to use the beta since we're not going to be worried about production and we want to have access to all of the new cool things available. Yes. You, um, so once you, if you click on it, there should be a drop down, so you could choose the beta. Yeah. So if you go, I'll just show it really quick. Um, so create uh, Core OS, and then you would select the version, and you could choose beta there. Uh, so for now, we just need the $5 droplet. Um, that's a 20 gigabyte SSD disk and five 12 megabytes of RAM. Um, it's $5 a month. Uh, the data center region, I think the default now is New York City 3. That one is fine. Um, and then below that, we have additional options, which I'll go through quickly so that you kind of understand what they're about. Uh, so the private networking, we don't need to worry about so much right now because we're just doing a single node. Uh, but this enables droplets to communicate with each other in a second interface that has no internet access. So this will allow you to send files securely from one droplet to another. And if you bring up the slides later today, uh, I linked out to all the relevant tutorials if you're interested in reading more about any of this. Uh, the backups enable weekly backups, so this is a time-based backup of your droplet. Um, it's just an easy way to automate that if what you have on the droplet you want to save. Uh, just something to keep in mind is that it adds 20% uh, to your monthly droplet cost. Uh, IPv6 option enables public IPv6 networking, and that's just the most recent version of the internet protocol or IP that the internet relies on to connect locations. Uh, so this just leverages the IPv6 with the most recent improvements. Uh, the user data option allows you to 
put in cloud config files or bash scripts. Uh, so once you load up your droplet for the first time, the root user will do whatever you put into this box. So on an Ubuntu server, it might look something like this, where you update your Ubuntu, and then you install Nginx, et cetera. We don't need to worry about this. Um, and then the, the monitoring you can't use with this, with um, CoreOS right now. Uh, so then finally, we're going to talk about the SSH keys. Um, SSH keys are a recommended security measure. Um, and for CoreOS, it's required. With other droplets, uh, like Ubuntu, you may be able to do like a, a user and password that gets emailed to you instead. Uh, this is my personal interface, so you see I already have an SSH key called work here as an option, or I could add a new SSH key, and I'll walk you through doing that right now. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, so SSH keys, they just provide a more secure way of logging into a <laughs> server instead of just using a password. Uh, so passwords, we know that they could be cracked by brute force attacks, but SSH keys are virtually impossible to do that. Uh, when you generate an SSH key pair, you're going to get two long strings of characters. One of those is the public key, and the other one is the private key. The public key you're going to place onto your server, and then you can unlock that server by connecting it with the client that has the private key on it. And the client is going to likely be your laptop or computer that you're using. So when these two match up, then you're able to unlock it without needing to use a password. And you could further increase that security by including a passphrase while you set up your SSH key pair. OK, so the first step to create a key pair on the client machine, which is your laptop today, um, is to open up your terminal and to type in this command. Let's see if I... Can you see that command OK, then? Are we together? OK, so then once you, yes? Uh, we don't need to use one right now. Like, if you have one, you could just, um, like, if you have one in your account, you could just use that, or you could copy it into your account. Uh, you could just we're we're gonna go through copying it. So if you have one on the computer, we could just copy it and and put it into the account. Okay. So then once you do that, you're going to get this prompt, uh, which you could also see in the terminal, um, to enter a file in which you want to save the key. Um, just pressing enter here is fine for now. Um, we can enter a passphrase if you want to, but make sure that you remember that. Um, I'm just going to put enter, and then at this point, you're going to get your random art image for your key, which looks something like this. And then if you already have an SSH key, is this is where you could come in. So we're going to pull that up with this command. So the output is going to look like this. And then I want you to uh, copy this, in, including the SSH hyphen RSA at the beginning. Um, so we're just going to copy it, put it into our clipboard. And then in our server setup here, we're going to add a new SSH key and paste it in. And then we could call it whatever name you want, like laptop or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Uh, it's for everybody. So once, once you generate a key, or if you already have an SSH key, if you pull this up, then you'll be able to access it, and you could copy it. Do you want me to go through any of that again? Okay, are we ready to move on then? Okay, so you could um, you would press add SSH key. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, I'll just use what I have, and then we would click create at the bottom. So you should be redirected to your droplets page, and your droplet will be getting spun up. And the blue bar at the bottom, or right next to it, will show you the progress. And then you should get your IP address that you could copy. How are our droplets? Are they coming up? I just want to talk to you a little bit about firewalls. Um, you could, if you don't want to put that up right now, you don't have to, but it's a good idea for security. Um, it's going to be on the same, um, well, it's actually going to be networking, but if you use the create, um, if you use this create button, you could pull up cloud firewalls here, or you could go to networking at the top and choose firewalls. Uh, basically, Firewalls are available at any of the digital ocean regions, and they're available at no additional charge. Um, they're network-based, stateful firewalls. They'll block all traffic that isn't expressly permitted by a rule. Um, so if you don't have any firewalls yet, your landing page will look like this, and you could choose Create Firewalls, or you could choose that Firewalls from the Create button at the top. Um, if you want to go through and create a firewall, for now, you could just use the default, and that should work fine. And then when you apply it to Droplet, um, the core OS Droplet that you just um, spun up, you could just write core to begin with, or which whatever you named it. Um, if anybody has any questions, I can walk around and help you out. Um, otherwise, we'll take a a five-minute break. All right. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Sweet. Uh, so first, uh, let's give a thank you to Lisa for giving the uh, first big intro. <laughs> Seems like we're all a little sleepy after working full day, uh, so I understand. Try and wake it up, put some energy in here. Um, let me find my slides to help out with that. Cool. So I'm going to talk to you about modern infrastructure, how you can build your own website on modern infrastructure, and why I think it's really cool. And part of that is containers. Um, I should give a heads up on this. Uh, I have a dog in this race. Um, I'm a community manager for a company that builds container-based products. So, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt, check it with your friends, make sure I'm not lying to you. Um, but this slide deck will, uh, you'll have links to it. You can go fact check it, do all that fun stuff later. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm Paul, I work at CoreOS. Uh, that's the company. I'm a community manager there. So if you pop into our IRC or uh, you ask questions on Twitter or you say bad things about us uh, in the middle of the night, I will appear and make you stop it. Um, also want to thank all of you for coming out today. Uh, I want to do something interesting or something that I think is important when uh, we're learning something new. Um, and that's, uh, first, have a little fun with it. But uh, second is to talk just about over and under generalizing for learning's sake. Um, so John Piaget 
Uh, if you took Psychology 101, this is a name you might have come across. Uh, he had an interesting theory of development when it comes to learning, and what he realized is like little kids, when they're first uh, associating with an object that they haven't come into contact with before, uh, they tend to overgeneralize or undergeneralize. So if we go back to this dog, um, they may call this a dog, they may call a cat a dog, they may call a cow a dog, um, and it's all because they're furry and they have four legs. Uh, and over time, they sort of, by either over or under generalizing, uh, kind of come to the right analysis of what a dog is. Um, and that's actually pretty important, and I think it's something we don't give ourselves room for as adults. Uh, and I'm gonna encourage you to do that today while we're learning about containers, because I am definitely gonna do it. Uh, so you're kind of strapped in for the ride no matter what, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, uh, some of the things that I say are probably going to be 90% true, not 100% true, and I'll try and call those out. Uh, those are things I'm going to do, uh, like for instance, talking about the kernel. I'll say it's basically just all the hardware stuff. Um, that's not necessarily true, but uh, it's close enough if you don't have a preconceived notion of what a kernel is on your Linux machine already. Um, cool, we all game with that? Everybody good? Sweet, I see thumbs up. Cool, so what's a container? It's a tar file. Does anyone know what a tar file is? Does anyone wanna give it, like, tell us? Yeah, that's right. So her answer was, it's just a compressed set of files, uh, like a zip. And actually, I have swag over here, so if you want CoreOS socks or a wallet or something, like, come on down. Um, feel free to snag one. Um, yeah, so that's actually exactly right. We actually did not collude or collaborate before these slides at all, I promise. Um, but a tar file is basically just Linux's version of a zip file, which we're all probably familiar with if we've been computing for a while. Um, and that's my presentation for today. That's containers. No, I'm joking. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> and there's obviously a lot more to it, so we're, we're gonna dive into that. Um, so containers, what they really are, are tar files plus uh, these five things, cgroups, chroot, unshare, nsenter, bind mounts. These are Linux syscalls that you probably will never use yourself. Uh, what this all sort of boils down to is Linux magic. Um, but it really means that containers are something you're going to use on Linux. Uh, if you're running Macs right now, you be, might be thinking like, wait a minute, my Macintosh isn't Linux, that's based on FreeBSD which is different, and you're right, but uh, how Docker and containers are running on your local Mac machines uh, is based on a small Linux VM that Docker has installed, so it's free BSD running Linux, which then runs the container, so you kind of cheat when we're running Macs. Um, but when we're running on the server, uh, what this really means is, <coughs> sorry, pardon me, um, that we get all these advantages of these basically just using system utilities that are on our basic Linux machine and not having to spin up a virtual machine. So a virtual machine is like really resource intensive. Uh, what it requires is your computer to emulate a CD-ROM drive, it emulates a disk drive, it pretends it knows it has an extra CPU, all this other stuff, there's a lot of overhead that goes into that. And uh, that has been negated somewhat with some uh, recent advances in CPU technology, that sort of thing. But the big thing is when you create a VM, you've probably noticed that you have to allocate a certain amount of resources to it. So you have to say, uh, this will use two gigabytes of my machine's memory for forever. That's gone. Um, can't use that anymore. The nice thing about containers is you basically just run the program like it's a normal application. Uh, those five uh, pieces of Linux magic that we talked about earlier keep everything isolated, everything nice, um, and it just uses however much resources it needs. Uh, what this usually results in is requiring about 50 to 80% less compute power overall when you're running large uh, distributed systems, um, which is really nice for the environment, it's really nice for your budget, uh, your bank account, um, all that good stuff. Uh, the idea of Linux containers is also really old. Uh, this gentleman, Brian Cantrell, uh, is the CTO of Joint. Uh, he is 
by far one of the most entertaining speakers you can possibly watch. This is like a 40 minute talk in this link. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, you may want to get like a sweat rag with you because you will definitely sweat watching him walk around on stage and gesticulate. Um, but it's excellent. It gives you kind of like the whole rundown of how containers came to be. Um, in addition to that, I kind of blew over, you know, NS Enter, CH root, C groups, bind mounts, all that stuff. If you're really curious about what all that magic is, uh, you can dig into either of these two links sometime later. Uh, these are from some of my coworkers at CoreOS, uh, and it explains really what's going on. But for now, if we would just want to generalize, container is basically all the goodness of a VM, that isolation, being able to separate things and keep things clean um, without uh, all the overhead and all the extra resources that are required from it. Does anyone have any questions so far? All right, cool. I see everybody's comfortable with magic, which I'm a fan of. Cool, so by containers, um, I think this is far more interesting than what containers are. I just told you what they are, but like, you're probably not motivated to use them so far. Um, and this is probably my favorite answer to that. So uh, I don't know about where you work, but where I work, uh, or where I used to work, uh, this was a common thing that would happen. You'd write a program, or your coworker would write a program, they'd give it to you to look at it, and you'd say, it doesn't work on my local machine, man. Like, what's going on? And they'd be like, well, it works on my local, figure it out. You'd spend half a week doing that, and then you get to actually do the work you're supposed to do. Um, or it works on all of your local machines, and you try and ship it to production, and you find out that your version of Node.js that you're using doesn't match the version of Node.js that's running in production. You've got an issue. Um, what containers do is they isolate all of those different version dependencies, uh, all the setup of running the app. You don't have to include instructions. The container just kind of sets everything up for you when you create it. Um, and it makes it so you can have a highly portable artifact for your code. So if you're running a website uh, and you want to be able to deploy it easily, uh, containerizing it means if you need to redeploy it, if something goes wrong with your website and you need to bring things down, put it back up, um, it's really easy. Uh, and in particular, since we're doing this for fun, um, hell probably isn't other people's development environments. It's probably you from three months ago. So <laughs> what's going to happen? We're gonna do this workshop, you're gonna set up a website on your DigitalOcean droplet, something else cool maybe. Um, you're gonna forget about it, and then a couple months go by, you're gonna to need to update it, you're gonna break something while you do that, and then you're gonna think, what the hell did I do to get this thing set up with, like this to begin with? Um, containers kind of save you from that because everything that goes into setting that site up, setting everything up, uh, gets packaged into the container, which makes it really easy to pick up where you left off. Uh, cool. Uh, this is all very abstract so far. So, um, for this next kind of section, um, you can try and follow along with me as I do this, but what I'm going to suggest is I will try and run these commands for you live uh, on this big screen. Um, I'll get to sort of like an image interstitial, uh, which will have a link to this slide deck, and then I will encourage you to open that slide deck and then go back and run these same commands yourself. So you'll watch me, um, we'll get to the image, we'll take a you know, five minute break again, I'll walk around, make sure everybody's able to run it on their local machines, and then we'll move forward to the next section. Does that sound good? Sweet. Any questions so far? Is the container on the server or on your local machine? Both. So uh, the question was, is the container on the server or our local machine? Um, the answer is both, and we're going to start with containers on our local machines. So if you looked at the meetup group, there was a request that you download Docker um, to get started. If you haven't uh, done that, we'll, uh, I can help you do that now that you're here. Um, but this uh, starting point kind of assumes you have that uh, sort of done. Cool. Uh, so let's just test that Docker uh, works locally by cutting and pasting this command. So this is a terminal like any other terminal, whoops, we've got an extra dollar sign here. So I will just run my hello world command. And if Docker is installed correctly, we should see something like this. So we've got that going for us, that's good. Uh, 
The second step is creating a test directory to kind of mess around in. So we want to make a web application, which means we're going to make a web page. Uh, so I'll go ahead and follow these instructions. Uh, go into my root directory, which is just, oops. No, this is like your root directory. That's what the little squiggly line means. Um, I have a directory crib, uh, which is the word, as I understand in English, means like the margin, the scratch. So anytime I'm making something that I know I'm just going to throw away, but maybe I'll keep it around a little while, I put it in the crib directory. So uh, I'm going to type the make dir, uh, and then I'm going to use the p command, I think, um, because crib already exists. And then we'll call it uh, women who code. Cool. And then I want to CD into that directory. And then the last command we had there was touch. Does anyone know what touch does? That, that can explain it? Yeah, it makes a file. That's right. So we have nothing here right now. Um, and if I touch index.html and I type ls again, we've got one now. So that's all that's doing. And uh, I want to open it up. So I'm going to open it up in my favorite editor, which is BS Code. You probably have your favorite editor. Let's not name names. I don't want to get into any fights here tonight. Um, but yeah. And wow, this is, this resolution is impressive on these projectors. Cool. So this is perfectly valid HTML, I'm told. Uh, and we can do something as simple as this uh, for our first file. We just want something that's unique to us. This could be an actual web page that we want to publish, uh, but this is good enough for government work, so to speak. So we'll close that and move along on our journey here. Cool. Uh, so I have these little click me kind of call outs, uh, different places throughout the slides. And uh, this is something for Caddy. So Caddy is an HTTP server, as this handy uh, guide kind of tells us. Um, if I click on a link to go to it. Uh, the really cool thing about Caddy is it makes it super easy to get your site on HTTPS. Uh, it uses Let's Encrypt. Um, it's kind of built from the ground up to be very friendly in a way that a lot of other web servers aren't. So you're probably used to working with Apache or Nginx. You could swap uh, Apache or Nginx in uh, for Caddy here. Uh, I just like this because I think it's a really cool project and uh, I think it makes it really accessible and easy to tweak and play around with uh, different aspects of this. Um, and thankfully, uh, I did a search uh, on the Docker registry. Uh, Docker is kind of synonymous with containers. It's the, the brand of containers that most people are using today. It's the most popular. Um, so that's why we have a Docker client on our machine. Uh, and we have the, the Caddy server here. So if I read through his guide, uh, he has you know, some information here, and he tells us to run this really long command. And I hear it's perfectly safe to just run commands that you find on the internet um, on your local machine, so I'm going to do that. And actually, uh, this command that I'm pasting in has a little bit of bash. Uh, this PWD, uh, this stands for present working directory, so it'll link to my current location and then uh, kind of execute the rest. It'll do a, a smooth replacement. Uh, because I'm using <clears throat> fish terminal, which is not bash, I think I need to delete that dollar sign if this doesn't work, then I'll try just running it in bash. Cool. Looks like it might have worked. So that was kind of arcane and disappointing. Um, but if this did work, uh, we should ostensibly be able to load something up. And let's just double check. So this says 8080 here. I'm copying that in. And that's our web page. 
that's super cool. So this is working. We've already containerized something on our local machine. Uh, and you may be thinking, like, wow, that was a lot of work for something I could do in like five seconds, Paul. Why did you go through all that extra effort? Um, well, it's because I'm sort of self-documenting uh, what is required to get this running, what is required to get it working as I go. So like I said, when uh, three-month-old me uh, forgets about this stuff, uh, you know, six months forward, um, I, I know exactly where to pick up. I, I have all the instructions kind of written out here. So let's, let's kind of dissect this command, because this is a little arcane uh, as, as to what's happening. So docker run uh, dash d, um, what this is really doing is it's, it's saying I want to run a container, uh, and I want to do it in the background. Um, does anyone know what background versus foreground is in Linux that can explain it? Sorry, like I said, I'm... I'm yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, she said... That uh, background is sort of like when you load a web page, uh, there are calls that happen, stuff is happening, but you don't necessarily see it. And then the foreground is something that's kind of visual that you see in front of you. Same thing is true in Linux. Um, the dash D is kind of, uh, you may have heard of tools like systemd or etcd, which is something my company makes. Um, anything that tends to have a D at the end um, usually means it's a daemon, uh, which is running in the background. So this is Docker's kind of command for running things in the background. Um, which is exactly what it did. It, it ran it in the background and returned control to me, so I have visual control of my terminal again. Um, the P uh, is setting something. Someone might be able to guess this. Does anyone want to take a guess? Port. Who, who shouted that? There you go. Uh, so I think actually like three people so far have like you back there, you and you. If you want to uh, come and like grab swag, feel free anytime to. Uh, Raid the, the chest here. Um, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> that's right. So the port uh, is just this, this number that we expose things on. So our computer has one IP address, and we couldn't direct every single program uh, from the internet to that one IP address. Ports give us like 60,000 different things we can associate to. Um, so ports uh, are just important for being able to run multiple things. Uh, what Docker does is it creates its own sub-network inside the container to separate that network from your main operating system. It's just a security uh, sort of precaution mainly, um, but it's convenience in some sense as well. And this P is just mapping port 8080 to port 2015 inside the container. Um, so it's just creating that bridge. So this one is a little trickier. Um, PWD, as I mentioned earlier, is just the present working directory. Uh, that uh, is my current location. Uh, v stands for volume. So what I'm actually doing is taking the, the file uh, location that is exposed to me right now in this folder, uh, and I'm after the colon saying, put this in var www html. That's a directory you're probably familiar with if you've worked with Apache at all. Um, and then uh, we're just giving some options uh, at the end of that with the RO. So uh, this is just sharing. It's basically sharing the index.html file. Uh, and finally, uh, joshix slash caddy is the name of the container we're running. So if we go back to that website that I read this uh, command from and executed blindly, um, you can see that that's actually just exactly what's up top here. So uh, this all sort of hopefully is starting to make a little bit more sense. It's not, not just magic. Um, but yeah, this is us running a server. And this server is actually still running on my local machine. Uh, actually, I can do this quicker. So, uh, in order to, you know, maybe ensure that I'm not running this web server for the rest of eternity, uh, we should figure out how to stop it at some point. 
So Docker comes with a lot of uh, built-in helper commands. Um, I'll clear my screen to make this a little easier to read. So Docker uh, PS is the command that we want to use, but uh, this is just convenience for any utility you're using uh, when it comes to Linux. If you type dash dash help, you'll usually get a list of all the options you have to actually execute after the fact. And you can see there's a whole host of them in Docker. Um, <clears throat> the one that I want to know is where that background job went. So I like the PS command here. That's, that's what we're going to go for. Um, cool, so we can see that this is actually our container running right now. Um, it's been up for about six minutes, that seems about right. It's running caddy inside of it, it's joshx slash caddy, and there's this SHA associated with it. Um, this SHA uh, looks probably similar to GitHub or Git SHAs. Uh, and the same way with Git SHAs where you can type something like git log, uh, like maybe the first couple characters and Git will match it for you automatically. That same thing applies here. Uh, so instead of typing like docker stop uh, 2FA F4E923, uh, I don't have to do all that. Like I was actually mistyping part of that as I was typing. I can actually just type docker stop and then the first couple characters and docker will interpret uh, that this is the most unique matching uh, container and stop that one. So this hopefully should work. Cool, and if I run docker ps again, I have no running containers. We've done everything successfully. So we've saved our system from an eternity of bad web pages. Cool, so this is one of those interstitial slides uh, I mentioned to you. Uh, I would like for you to make your own bad web pages and run them inside of a container. Um, hopefully you will go from a kind of the top here, just testing that Docker Hello World works, uh, all the way down to uh, cleaning up after yourself, and then we'll get started with the next section. So give it a whirl. Um, this URL in the lower, whoop, hey, that's not good. Let's fix that. Magic. Cool. So yeah, this URL in the lower right-hand corner, this should take you to the slide deck, and you should be able to follow those steps yourself. Cool. So I've just been informed. I have a bug in my code that I'm going to fix for you right now. Um, thank you for catching that, by the way. So on this where is it? This slide right here. I think I actually need to edit it over here. Uh, I am missing the dash p uh, in the make directory command. Dash p basically just lets me make multiple directories, multiple subdirectories. Um, if you don't add that p flag in there, you'll get an error. So sorry about that. Good catch. And a, uh, another bit of clarity, uh, thank you for pointing this out as well. Um, this syntax right here, where these slashes are, uh, this is just fancy bash syntax that lets me break multiple things up into multiple lines. You don't necessarily have to use those slashes and hit enter. Um, you can just forget about the slashes, forget about hitting enter, do it all as one line, and it should make it easier to type into your terminals. All right. How's everybody doing? Good? Cool. Let's keep rolling. So 
question you might be asking about all of this, this is pretty complicated. Why don't I just use GitHub Pages or Heroku or Netlify to host my blog? Um, that's a great question. You should do that, but this is more fun. So we're gonna do it this way. Um, and I like to think of this like, uh, there's really two outcomes. We do it this way and we decide we like GitHub Pages or Heroku or some other service. Um, some other service that makes this stuff really easy and all we have to do is write the HTML and it does everything else for us um, and that's fine. Um, but after going through this process, we now have some context and some appreciation for what those services actually give us instead of taking it for granted so we appreciate them more. Um, or we find this really interesting and fun and we enjoy tinkering with it uh, and we get to do some learning, which is also a bonus. So either way, we win. Uh, going through this little exploration. And I, I also sort of like the analogy of like baking your own bread. Like, I don't know, I'm not a great baker, but when I bake bread, it even though the stuff I get at a local bakery tastes way better um, and it's way fresher there, the stuff that I make, I know I made it and I know what went into it, uh, so it's like special to me, so hopefully um, this thing that we're creating is a little bit special to you, um, and it'll be a little more fun that way. Cool, so we've simplified things a little bit in setting up our own infrastructure here. Um, we're only using one node to do it, and I wanna take this chance to just kinda talk about how most, most uh, businesses, if you're doing this in the workplace or something like that, are running um, websites, it used to be uh, way back in the day, you'd buy a giant single behemoth of a machine, and when you couldn't handle enough load on that machine, you'd buy an even bigger behemoth of a machine to move all your stuff to. Uh, and that's kind of changed, that's, and that's really what the cloud is, is that change happening um, in a really efficient, effective way. So what has started to happen is the same circuits and chips that are in our laptops are the same circuits and chips that are being run on the cloud. Uh, and it's just, instead of one of them, it's like a million of them. Uh, and we get to buy them, use them, rent them. Um, that's kind of the cool thing that DigitalOcean is doing for us is it's letting us rent basically the same machinery we have here out there uh, in their nice co-located facilities. Um, and uh, they make it really easy. We just have to click a button and we've got it, it's ours. Uh, that's really nice, uh, but what that means is you end up with a lot of different servers and it turns out programming for a lot of different servers instead of programming for just the one server uh, makes things a lot more challenging. Um, so a lot of what we're gonna talk about and a lot of the advantages of working with containers uh, is partly dealing with this distributed nature, um, but this is something we're gonna kinda ignore for the moment, just because we're doing this as a fun learning exercise, but just keep that in the back of your mind that this is also really beneficial in that uh, bigger space. And yeah, I, I like this somewhat smudgy comic, um, what's the cloud made of? Other people's Linux servers mostly. Um, so yeah, thanks DigitalOcean, uh, appreciate the loan. And uh, these two terms, PaaS and YaaS, I uh, actually don't really know how to pronounce that last one. Um, I sometimes just call it IaaS. Uh, this is platform as a service versus infrastructure as a service. So um, platform is something where, like I said before, all we have to do is make our web page and something else just runs it. And there are services that do that. Uh, like Heroku is a popular one, but it seems like almost every cloud provider out there is starting to offer similar sorts of services. Uh, so I would not be surprised to see DigitalOcean uh, hopping into the PaaS game at some point in the future. Uh, so far, they are um, probably one of the best IaaS providers, um, thanks to like all the docs and things that they have. Um, and IaaS is basically like you go to the hardware store, you buy some wood, you buy some nails, and you kind of assemble the house, the tree house, whatever you're building yourself. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing today. We're working on the IaaS side. Um, but if you get through all this and you're like, you know what, I have a lot of appreciation for what it takes to build a birdhouse or a treehouse, but I don't want to do it myself. I want to <laughs> have someone else build it for me. Um, 
you can Google for PaaS options, and uh, that is definitely the easier, safer route. But I say to hell with safety. So <laughs> let's log in to our DigitalOcean droplets. Um, so I have another click me link here. And I actually don't know what is in here. So let's surprise myself. Ah, actually, I think that's, yeah, OK, cool. So we're going to dive into our uh, DigitalOcean droplets, which we have to use our SSH keys to do. Um, so this is the cool kid way, uh, the very secure way to log in. Um, you can set GitHub up to use SSH keys as well, which I highly recommend you do. Um, very safe, very secure, very cool. Um, but for now, let's uh, figure out how to use the key that we just made uh, to log into our DigitalOcean droplets. So uh, I'll try running this command on my local machine. So command went something like this. You can see it kind of grayed out there. And I have uh, .ssh. And actually, let's just see what's in my .ssh directory. So I have a couple SSH keys here. Uh, the one that I want to use is for funds. That's what I've associated with my DigitalOcean droplet. So I'm going to type my command out again. Uh, core is just the username that's supplied by default on my CoreOS machine. Um, and then this, there's an IP address there. And this is just not the IP address you probably want to use. You're going to want to replace this. Uh, but if I head over to my DigitalOcean droplet, I do have my real IP address here. So this is what I want to copy. I want to copy this. And nope, not now. Paste that here. And this is my whole command. So I've got ssh-i. Dash i is basically telling SSH which key I want it to use. I'm selecting a key very specifically. And then I'm logging in with the username core. Uh, and then the IP address is telling it which DigitalOcean machine we are going to log into. So if I hit that, uh, I should see something like this. I'm greeted with a welcome to Container Linux by CoreOS. I'm on my beta box. That's very cool. Yes, if you set up the SSH key without naming your key, if you just hit the default, you may not need the dash i command. That's a really good note. Um, cool, so we're gonna look at system D. Uh, so does anyone remember what the dash D stands for from earlier? Daemon. Daemon, yes, correct. Um, but thank you for the answer. Um, so the daemon uh, basically is something that runs in the background. Uh, in the case of system D, uh, the daemon is what's known as our init process. So init is kind of the mother of everything that runs on your machine. It manages, keeps things organized, um, kind of, it's the caretaker, um, and maybe it's sexist for me to say mother, so I should say the mother or father, depending on uh, how your household's set up. Um, but yeah, what system D does is it runs the processes that you tell it to run. If something crashes, it'll try and recover from that crash. Uh, and it actually ends up doing a lot more than that, um, which is why system D is actually somewhat controversial, uh, which we'll get to in a second. So uh, if we click on this click me link, um, we'll be taken to some, a list of commands here for system D essentials, which are just you know, some suggested things uh, we can run on system D to see what's happening. We don't have an nginx.service running, um, but this will give you kind of the gist of uh, how to work with system D. Uh, so this is a very handy guide that DigitalOcean has provided to um, work through this. And, one of the nice things about systemd is it has become kind of the init system of choice for almost every major version of Linux. So whether you're using CoreOS like we're doing today uh, or you're using any other uh, distribution of Linux later on, um, systemd is probably going to be there. So what you learn here uh, is going to be great for basically taking anywhere. And uh, that drama that I mentioned earlier, like who needs Game of Thrones? Uh, 
This is amazing. Uh, so the creator of Linux, Linus Torvalds, very recently, I think this is dated at 18th of July, uh, he, on a public mailing list, called out systemd, um, said some nasty things about it, uh, and it's, it's actually been a hot topic uh, in the Linux community for a while, so if you are asking questions about systemd online or you read about systemd online or you Google for it, uh, I guess just don't be alarmed if people are like, I friggin' hate systemd. Uh, there's a lot of passion that goes around this. Uh, despite the drama and all that other stuff that's happening, um, it is the standard that we're using right now, uh, and it is modern. Um, so I'd expect it to stay that way for at least you know, a couple years longer, so it's definitely worth uh, picking up. Um, but if you want to dive into the drama, there's a link uh, down here that'll take you to that article, which is you know, fun bedtime reading. Cool. Um, so now that we are inside of our DigitalOcean droplet, um, let's take a look at what's happening. Uh, so we have these commands uh, that interact with systemd, system cuddle, uh, journal cuddle, and uh, I'll just run those, so system cuddle, uh, and I want to list units. Cool. So I, what I'm doing by listing units is I'm basically looking at all of the processes that systemd is managing for me right now. Um, and I can, do, uh, I can do something naive and try and hit the up arrow or the down arrow, uh, and it'll sort of work. Uh, but really, uh, this is... Uh, using kind of Emacs or Vim uh, commands if you're used to those. So if you hit like F or B, you can start jumping like whole pages at a time and that's really like the way uh, to go. So if, if you get tired of this and you're like, wait a minute, how do I exit this crazy uh, shell that we're stuck in now that I'm looking at all these things, um, what you wanna do is hit the Q key and that'll help you exit. So. One more time, uh, I can list my units with system cuddle list units. Uh, F and B are the best way to kind of uh, navigate around. And uh, what I'm doing is basically just looking at uh, things that I might want to view the logs for. Uh, just see what's running on my system, do some exploration, uh, get to know our environment. So uh, this one, Locksmith D, usually has decent number of warnings and other stuff that it spits out. Uh, so that being the noisy uh, neighbor, uh, it's probably a good one to check the logs for. So let's try running uh, journal cuddle, which is our tool for viewing our logs that systemd spits out. Uh, and then I'm gonna type dash u for unit, and then because that unit uh, file name was named locksmithd, type that. And then I can see the logs for this. So I can see uh, this started on uh, Tuesday and ends sometime Wednesday in UTC. Uh, and it looks like it had uh, trouble establishing some locks. And that's probably because it's a single node and uh, we're running a single node machine on CoreOS. CoreOS uh, expects to be running in multiple nodes. So it's just confused, like, why don't I have any friends? What's going on? Um, it's fine, we don't need to worry about it right now. But it's cool, you can kind of see what's uh, happening inside your system. And your own programs uh, may potentially spit out logs like this too. So this is essential if you need to debug or uh, figure out what's happening on your DigitalOcean droplet. Cool, so um, I've been saying journal cuddle, system cuddle. This is actually another like idiom similar to the D that appears at the end of commands. Um, some people call it cuttel. Uh, I think it really stands for control. It's a way to control specific objects. Um, but personally, I think it's way more fun to say cuddle than to say control. So I say we just all say cuddle, bury the hatchet, um, yeah. Cool, so uh, I once again want you, oh no, it's cut off again. <laughs> uh, but you should have this hopefully open from before. Um, I once again want, would like to invite you to uh, give this a shot. So, uh, you know, everything, the system, the SSH login and uh, running the systemd commands, uh, those are 
good to run, and you'll be inside your DigitalOcean droplet and able to start uh, experimenting. We're almost uh, where we need to be. And I'll walk around and answer questions. All right, how's everybody feeling? We're on the home stretch. Uh, we, uh, I've talked to some folks here. We may not all be on the same page because there are various uh, places you can get tripped up. I take full responsibility. I made these slides yesterday and today, like I was working on them up to the last minute, so they may not be as clear as they need to. Um, but thanks to your feedback, I hope to have V2 of this go much smoother. So um, I appreciate you bearing with me. Um, and we, it, we're at uh, like 8.15 now, and I think we're scheduled to run until 8.30. So uh, what I'm going to do for the rest of this is kind of um, hopefully just breeze through and give you a taste of uh, what we're supposed to do, maybe not even execute the rest of these, uh, so you can at least get kind of the philosophy that I'm trying to throw out uh, about how this stuff's supposed to work. Um, Cool. So uh, now that we are on our DigitalOcean boxes, we should be able to run something like Docker run Hello World and run Hello World on our machine as well. Um, so our DigitalOcean boxes should be able to do the exact same thing we did on our local machine. And the ideal is um, we want to take that web page that we created earlier and be able to access it the same way we're accessing that Hello World. How do we do that? We do it with an image registry, of course, except what's an image registry? Yeah, uh, it's another thing you have to learn. Um, so uh, there are a lot of image registries out there. My company makes one called Quay.io, uh, given that I, that's the one that I am most familiar with. Um, I think it's a great one to visit and uh, upload uh, your file to. So. In order to get our little web page running on Caddy uh, into this image registry, we'll have to exit our DigitalOcean droplet and uh, upload it, do some work. So you'll type exit in your shell or open a new shell uh, and uh, go back to your local machine. And if we are building a Docker image instead of just running a Docker image, uh, the command might look something like this, uh, docker build t. T is basically the name we're giving to our image. So I've named my image Evelyn here. Uh, and Evelyn uh, is pulling her image data from the current directory. That's what the dot is in, uh, dash, or in bash syntax. Um, once we build Evelyn locally, we should be able to run Evelyn locally. Uh, so this docker run dash dash rm, the dash dash rm basically just says we want to remove the image after we're done with it. So we don't need to type like docker stop, do the docker cleanup uh, afterwards. Uh, dash it makes it interactive so we can actually log into our container and see what's inside the container, which is really cool. Um, it's basically just uh, the bin sh gives us uh, access to that interactive shell uh, when the container launches. So uh, this is a fun command to play around with. We don't have time to uh, dive in in this presentation, unfortunately, but uh, try and make time next time. And uh, something that's a little bit more fun is maybe checking out a Python container. Um, there's a little more to play around with there than just a bad HTML page we made right now. Um, but yeah, this, this basically lets you install software on your system without worrying about like it installing stuff all over the place and creating chaos on your local machine or uh, worrying that your install of some database that's required for the thing you're working on is the same as Bob's or Cheryl's. Um, this is kind of the beauty of containers. This is what we were talking about before. It keeps everything uh, nice and tidy, and everything works the way it's supposed to, um, and it's wonderful. So uh, this uname command basically just uh, spits out some information about your Linux system. So it's just it's basically you go inside the container. The container will identify itself when you say uname a. Um, so that's just something fun to do. Uh, and then. Now that we have this build file we've built, um, we could send it as a tar, as we discussed earlier. We could export it as a tar using the docker command. Um, we could create something called a docker file, which is the ideal way to do it, uh, or it can be pushed um, from the command line interface. So uh, yeah, that's 
how to create a Docker file is actually linked uh, in those the Joshix slash caddy docs. He mentions how to create a Docker file in addition how to just run it. Um, so those would be the steps that you'd follow. Um, next step would be if we want to run this as a long-term living running thing on our web server, we'd create a systemd unit file, which uh, these links will lead you to wonderful guides from CoreOS and DigitalOcean uh, telling you how to do that. Uh, and yeah, we should talk about why we're doing all of this work. Um, and the reason is com computers are better than us. I don't know if you know that, but it's, it's true. And I'll prove it to you. Uh, so uh, you may remember recently that Amazon S3 had an outage. Uh, and the outage caused, I think, you know, day and maybe change. Uh, for Amazon services to be down across like the East Coast, businesses were like going crazy. And if we zoom in on this after action report from S3, what was the reason? Uh, unfortunately, one of the inputs to the command was entered incorrectly, and a large set of servers, a larger set of servers was removed than intended. So literally, someone typing a command incorrectly brought down all of AWS and all of the uh, supporting underlying infrastructure uh, as a result of that kind of chain reaction. Um, so, like, this probably makes you feel better if you mistyped something while we were going over the SSH instructions or whatever else. Like, not a big deal. You didn't take down AWS. It's cool. But uh, I think the lesson here is also, like, the person who was doing this and uh, is probably very talented. AWS uh, hires very talented people. Um, and this is something that happens to the best of us. Uh, so the reason we like to automate things is, is because when you automate things with a computer, computers are very, very good at doing exactly the thing that you tell them to. Uh, so when you need to do it again, three months in the future, six months in the future, it will do exactly that thing, um, which is why uh, writing out these containers, uh, putting it into a systemd unit file uh, makes this so lovely. It means we've got everything we need to uh, run our systems in one place. So uh, a lot of this philosophy comes from Google, uh, believe it or not. Um, Google uh, came up with this term, the SRE. Uh, it is, the SRE is a, sys, a site reliable, reliability engineer. Um, it's a term that doesn't necessarily mean a whole heck of a lot uh, at this point. But uh, the really cool thing is Google released the book for SRE uh, from O'Reilly for free online. So you can click in and read it. Um, I recommend uh, if you just want to dabble, uh, reading the first chapter at least, just to get a gist of what uh, infrastructure uh, building and uh, operations uh, is like and what kind of concerns they try and think about uh, day to day. But this is probably one of the best kind of portals you, you will have into um, that world. And I think it's like super cool that they just made it like free to read online. Um, like this is probably one of the best resources you can actually uh, even consume to just like get your head into that space and do this full time. So if this is like a career path that appeals to you, like read through the whole book, um, apply some of the principles to your new DigitalOcean server, um, it'll do you good. And whoop. Sorry, I'm having hearing issues. <laughs> um, so what is DevOps? DevOps is probably something you've heard about in a similar space. Uh, I like this tweet from Cindy Shridharan, who uh, is an SRE at a startup in San Francisco. She also runs the Prometheus Meetup. Um, and in particular, I think the biggest thing to take away is that DevOps is not a profession. Um, as she notes, DevOps is a philosophy where people who develop uh, applications and the people who run servers like these DigitalOcean droplets, those are two separate professions. Um, there's a lot of overlap between what you do. Um, and in particular, I think containers make it way easier for that overlap to happen. Um, it gives you a unified kind of language to speak instead of you speaking German and them speaking French. Um, you're both speaking Italian, um, so to speak. So uh, containers make 
uh, doing DevOps a lot more accessible. So by learning how to use containers, um, you're making yourself more marketable as a developer, which is also wonderful. Um, the other good piece of this is pets versus cattle. This is somewhat of a graphic metaphor, I apologize. Um, but it's the idea that if something goes wrong with our server, like I said, we log in sometime down the line, we try and edit things, we break everything, and we need to start it again. Um, we don't have to hold on to that server and try and save it and put it through surgery and bring it back to life. Because we've containerized all this stuff and automated it, um, we can just kill the server, be savage, take it by the neck, um, bring it back up, and it should just work because it's all automated, um, which is wonderful, uh, versus a pet, uh, which is like, you don't wanna lose the pet. It has your website on it, you can't lose it, so you put it through surgery, you, you dump blood, sweat, tears into it, uh, and you still at the end of the day may not be able to save it. And unfortunately, uh, that is something worth doing for your pets. I highly endorse uh, that. Like pet insurance is amazing. Um, you should definitely get it if you own a dog or a cat. But uh, when it comes to your servers, you don't want that sort of insurance. You definitely want to treat them as cattle. You do not want to give uh, your server names where you say like, oh yeah, uh, Kermit the Frog is acting weird today. Um, he's always weird, you know. Um, you know, assuming your servers are named after Muppets. Um, you get into that sort of situation where you're doing that at work, that means you've gone into the pets mentality and you need to rethink how you're automating your infrastructure. Uh, and this leads to immutable infrastructure, which is, uh, it's, it's exactly that. Uh, nothing is changed or edited on the server after you spin it up and run all the automation scripts. So. What uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, I think there were user scripts, the bash scripts you run at the very beginning when you're spinning up your server. The ideal way to do this uh, is in those cloud configs or in those initial bash scripts, uh, and then to never touch it again. And if you do need to change something, you change those scripts and restart the server. Uh, and again, that just means everything is saved. So if you need to kill the server at some point in the future, uh, you don't have to remember what you did to set it up before. Uh, so immutability is really just the idea that once you set something, you never change it. And if you do need to change something, you just uh, sweep it all to the side and bring down an entirely new version of the thing. Cool. Um, so does it work? Uh, I'd like to say yes. Um, so at a very large scale, containers do work very well with orchestration, which is something that uh, we can dive into, you know, maybe uh, two versions of this in the future. Um, and the most popular version of uh, orchestration is Kubernetes, which is a project that uh, my team works on, uh, CoreOS. Uh, and uh, that comes out of Google. Uh, their kind of lessons learned, you know, running massive Google scale around the globe. Um, turns out Google's been running containers for like 10, 15 years themselves and have a lot of lessons they've learned from it. And Kubernetes is them sharing that uh, learning with the open source world and um, collaborating on kind of the next version of that technology uh, in the open, which is really, really cool. Cool, so resources. Um, this is a link to just uh, DigitalOcean community. Some of the stuff we went over today might be a little uh, crazy. Um, in the community section, there's actually a lot of uh, very approachable, very fun, easy things you can install just straight up on DigitalOcean. Like, I think one of my favorites is you can install an entire discourse site from a single container on DigitalOcean, which is like you get to combine what you learned about containers, um, you get to run it on the DigitalOcean droplet that you've gotten uh, thanks to the code they provided earlier. Uh, and uh, that gives you like a little messaging board that you can chat with friends on, um, which is really cool. Um, CoreOS docs, uh, our documentation will give you a little more insight into the technical side of things and how this works uh, on larger scale distributed systems. Um, and more specifically, if you want to brush up just on Linux or get more familiar with uh, some of the basic concepts, like uh, you're tripping up on SSH or you didn't understand what uh, was happening here or there, um, I highly endorse Linux Academy. Uh, I am a customer of them. Uh, they, gosh, I think their rates are like 20 bucks a month. Um, 
and they will actually provide servers for you as well for that $20 like while you're learning. So all that's kind of like bundled in. Um, and I basically just keep a running subscription going because uh, it's a great way for me to revisit old topics or um, look up technologies that I may have gotten a little rusty on and uh, try and relearn it and experiment. So I think this is a great resource as well. Cool. Uh, and that's it. So yeah, I want to say thank you for coming out tonight. I'm sorry uh, we had to rush sort of through the last uh, segment here. Um, but uh, all of your feedback will definitely help improve V2 of this.